In his awesome music documentary, famed director Peter Bogdanovich tells a story about a young man and his band from Gainesville, Florida called Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Seems simple enough. Go record a demo, pile into the minibus, and drive to LA, because after all, that's where the record labels are. So welcome to the music business 1.0. Definitely old school. Five to six major record labels, scandals rocking the industry, payola for play on the radio. And over the next decade or so, small independent labels would come and go, lots of consolidation within the industry, until thankfully, Al Gore invented the internet. <laughs> so welcome to the music business 2.0. Awesome. Oops. And also welcome to file sharing and Napster and Kazaa and Rhapsody and many others and the industry continued to, to change. What happened after that, of course, <clears throat> as other distribution vehicles tended to proliferate, we had something else that came onto the scene, OMG, American Idol such that over the last just five to 10 years, when you think about it, the industry has changed so radically that something happened that had never happened before. In 2009, there were more Grammy Awards handed out to independent artists than to those that were part of major labels. So welcome to the music business 3.0. Today, the way we find and consume music continues to evolve and so does the world of the artists that create and distribute it. I'm Ron Cook. I'm the program director for the Entertainment Business Master of Science degree program here at Full Sail, and your moderator for what we hope will be a fun and informative session this morning. Kim Kraft is an entertainment attorney, and her practice concentrates in music, publishing, and copyright law. Kim has authored a number of literary works and has represented both artist and management and served on numerous panels to assist young artists. In 2004, Kim's techno dance work, Let Me Out, won the VH1 Song of the Year contest in the electronic category. Kim is the course director for, for entertainment media publishing and distribution. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kim Kraft. <laughs> Brandon Edgerton spent more than 10 years at EMI Gospel Records as an A&R executive and was involved in the creation, development, and promotion of more than 125 albums, including a number with award-winning artists. In 2008, he launched Sideman Music Consulting and Beyond Potential University, two career development resources for indie musicians. His professional recognition includes three Grammy Award nominations as executive producer a and and nine certified gold plus selling albums to his credit. Brandon is associate course director for entertainment media distribution. Please welcome Brandon Edgerton. Jackie Otero's career in the music industry included working with the management teams of both major label and independent artists and led to the formation and licensing and management company Front Burner Music, which represented a roster of over 15 clients, included Arrested Development founding member Speech. Jackie is department chair for the Music Business Bachelor of Science degree program here at Full Sail. Please welcome Jackie Otero. <laughs> Bill Thompson is the course director for Final Project in the Entertainment Business Master's Program. Bill is a musician, composer, and lyricist, and is also a published poet. Bill's music is distributed worldwide in over 150 countries, and he's reached the top 10 in the Japanese electronic music charts. Bill's also a voting member of the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences, and each year cast his ballot for the Grammy Awards. He's also the owner of a DJ and sound production company. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bill Thompson. <laughs> uh, 
and last and certainly not least, Israel Vascatelli's media and entertainment career has been as publisher of Insomniac Magazine, as journalist and radio host, where he has covered many prominent entertainment and media industry professionals. He's interviewed a variety of intriguing media figures from marketing guru Seth Godin to cult film director Lloyd Kaufman, a true who's who in the business. His album with hip hop legend Cool Keith re received acclaim in Rolling Stone, Spin, and many other major media outlets. Israel directed documentaries about the music industry and has appeared in music business books published by Billboard, including, how appropriate, Start and Run Your Own Record Label and I Don't Need a Record Deal. Israel's the course director for music merchandising and retail promotions. Please welcome Israel Vascatelli. Kim, when we talk about music distribution these days, we hear so much about aggregators. Everybody's talking about the aggregators. What exactly are they? How do they work? And do the artists really get paid? So take it away. Good question. Thank you, Ron. Good morning, everyone. If you're trying to self-publish and promote your own music, you don't have a record deal, you're not working with a label, essentially an aggregator is your distributor. And I'm sure many of you have heard of, of TuneCore, CD Baby, and so forth. What these companies really do is provide the distribution support, and in some cases, the marketing support. They also act as a revenue gatherer. Basically, they'll collect all your revenue streams from the different places where your music is listed and put them into a single account that that they have set up for you, so you don't have to run around town. It's a fairly simple process, and it's a very necessary one. In the olden days, the label would act as your distributor and get you on iTunes and Amazon and in record stores and, and so forth. Today, if you try to do that yourself, it's a very difficult and time-consuming process. In some cases, uh, individual artists, for example, uh, may not be allowed to get their music on iTunes. Or if you go to iTunes, you have to fill out a very complicated application form. Uh, they do a background check on your business. They want you to have a business banking account, and it really gets overwhelming for an artist or a group that just, I just want my music out there on iTunes, come on. So the simplicity of an aggregator is, I go to this company and they take care, they take care of all the business work for me. Uh, all I have to do is upload my digital file to them. If I have hard copies, I can also send them a CD. In some cases, I can literally just mail it to them. It's very simple. They'll set up the account, and then they have relationships with all the retailers where you want your music to go. For example, they'll have the relationships with Amazon MP3, iTunes, uh, Spotify, Rhapsody, iHeartRadio, Sirius. Uh, some of them, if you also want to do a hard copy physical, distribution, even have arrangements with Walmart, Target, and so forth. So they're your key to getting your product out there for your customers. Now, as far as, uh, well, they, do, you, do you actually get paid? You do. Um, you have to pay to get on the service, first of all. It's usually not a lot of money. Uh, for singles, usually you're talking in the area of 5 to $10 per single. Uh, for an album, it's, it's around $20. If you want a foreign distribution of your work, then it's a little bit more money. It might be up to $40 for, your, for an album. Um, so, so they will get you out there, um, and you will get royalties if you make sales. Some of these companies, all you have to do is pay that initial setup fee, the $5 or the $10 or what have you, and then whatever the retail prices you set, you would get that money from them, assuming you got sales. Uh, and that's another kind of a tricky thing. They'll tell you, oh, well, we'll get your, you know, your hard copy in stores, too, if you want to. But what they don't tell you is, Purchasing agents at the stores will determine if they want to buy those copies or not. So it's not a guarantee. What I always tell clients uh, and students is your content has to be very, very good. You also have to have a lot of marketing support. I'll sum it up by saying you will get paid if you make sales. And the sales come from really good content and marketing so that people know that you're out there. Now, one of the things Kim just mentioned was the role of aggregators and marketing artists. And one of the things that's happened as we move away from record labels and more into self-distribution, the whole 
labels uh, function of artist development has changed a little bit. So I'd like to ask Brandon a question. Since the labels, major labels, are not as involved in up-and-coming artists in terms of their development, today's artists need to sort of develop themselves. So, you know, what challenges does that pose for these aspiring artists? Yeah. Well, first of all, good morning, everyone. Great to see everybody. Uh, you're right. I think uh, Ron and Kim both uh, put it quite eloquently. Um, it, we're in a changing business. I mean, a lot has changed since Music Business 1.0. Uh, and one of those things have certainly been, you know, many of you guys, if you had aspirations uh, as artists, it, the, the, the whole concept or the whole goal years ago was being discovered. You know, and since then, there's been a lot of different avenues and a lot of different uh, mechanisms to actually get your music out there. I'd, I'd venture to say uh, that there really aren't really too many undiscovered acts anymore. Uh, in, in fact, I look at it more like there's uh, plenty of undeveloped acts. And for me, that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest, it presents the greatest opportunity, I think, for you guys out there. I think it's a fantastic time as an artist to be, uh, uh, to, to want to get your music out into the marketplace. A lot of the roadblocks, a lot of the challenges and things of that nature that have existed previously, you know, they're, they're, they're not so much there anymore. It's presented some other challenges. You certainly have to invest now more into your own career than you once had to. You can no longer uh, rely on a label to put the dollars that they once were able to into your project. Um, but it, it, the opportunity there exists to where now you get to share in a greater amount of the revenue, which at the end of the day is what we all want to do. We always want, all want to be, be able to be successful in the business aspect of what we do and to share the creativity and the music that uh, that, 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 and the gift that we have, share that with the marketplace. And so the, one of the biggest challenges I think that's presented from an artist development standpoint is uh, the production piece. Quality is the first step. You've got to have that from a songwriting perspective all the way up through the production elements to marketing, everything. Quality is where it's at. And I think the advances in technology have certainly opened up uh, many... Um, a lot more producers out there. And you really have to understand what production really is and what it means to actually produce. Uh, just because you programmed a track doesn't mean you are an actual producer. There's a lot more that goes into that. But in my experience, what I've seen is everyone has their own Pro Tools rig, everyone has their own gear uh, in their basement, in their closet, in their bathroom, in their bathtub. Uh, I mean, you know, everybody's making records everywhere nowadays. Um, but we can't forget the quality aspect of things have, has to be there. So you have to invest in the relationships and the networking, invest your dollars, invest your time to make sure you're creating uh, a quality product that the marketplace actually wants to participate in. So that, to me, that's where it really begins. Uh, next, it's a surrounding yourself with a great team that can help you achieve the same things that a record label did for you or was supposed to do for you if that was the, the route that you were going to go. Everything from, and we'll talk about a lot of that, you know, marketing, uh, radio, all those things that labels do for you. Uh, you've got to figure out a way to fulfill a lot of those roles yourself and invest in uh, people that you can put on your team, hiring consultants, hiring uh, other professionals in the business to help you uh, do those things that are, that are necessary to actually develop as an artist. So. A question for Jackie would be, just as the way that we create and distribute music has certainly changed over the last several years, so too is the way that consumers find and consume music. So maybe you can speak to that for a moment. Absolutely. I, I come to the music industry as a fan, as a consumer of music, not as an artist like some of these folks up here with me. So I think of Music 3.0 as how many amazing tools do we have now to discover and to listen and to consume music. So that's an exciting time for me as a music fan. Um, how many of you guys are using Turntable FM? Anyone? Okay, try it out if you haven't already. That's my new favorite one, along with Spotify. How many Spotify users in the crowd? Okay, a few more. Um, I encourage you, if you want to be in this music industry, if you want to work, if you want to make a living in the music industry, be a consumer of all things music. Um, because we really need to know what the consumers want in order to be able to predict what the next step is. Um, you have, you know, of course, visionaries like, like Steve Jobs, um, who knew that we wanted that iPod before we knew it. Um, it's hard to predict those things, but if you follow where the consumers are going, they will lead you the right way. Um, if you look at Turntable, 
um, for those of you guys who haven't tried it out or haven't seen it yet, um, it's basically this virtual club that you go into with your avatar and you have five DJs sitting at a booth and they're spinning music for you and there's usually some kind of consensus of the theme of the room and DJs can rotate in and out. Um, so it's, it's going back to curation. Um, if you guys have listened to Pandora over the last few years, which I was completely on board with Pandora for a long time, you don't have a curator choosing the music for you. Um, you have a machine that's automated to do it for you, which is a very cool concept in itself to think about um, how is music connected by its, its own elements, not, by, not because somebody else thinks they should be connected. Um, so it was an automated process. But I think what we're really moving towards now is more curation. More, we need more curators in the music industry because if you listen to the radio in your car, you're not listening to curators. You're listening to morning talk show hosts that play a set playlist that's distributed all across the country and set by a corporation. Um, and they're in the business of selling advertisements. They're not in the business of music. Um, so I think that, you know, looking for who's the next big curator. Um, I think of music supervisors as being curators. Um, the ones who are choosing music that goes into film and TV. And they're really becoming more important tastemakers these days. Um, so I think, you know, follow... Uh, you know, for all the consumers, how are, they, how are they demanding their music now? That's what's going to take you down the next path of where we're going in this new kind of music 3.0. And I think it's an amazing time to be a music consumer. I mean, I come from a background where I used to, I had my AM, FM stereo with two cassette tape, you know, in there. So I could record one and I could transfer it over onto another one to make my mixtapes. And, um, I mean, I would record hours off of the radio station to get that one song that I was hoping would come up. You know, I mean, to think that that was just in my lifetime is not that long ago, and to see where we are now, I think it's such a great time to be a music fan. Bill, over the, you know, the last number of years, you've chosen not to go that major label route, and you've decided to continue to be independent. What, what went into that decision-making process for you? Well, hello everybody. Uh, basically, it was control. Uh, when I was 19, uh, I was actually in a southern rock band and we were signed to a major label. We were actually signed by Phil Walden, who's the same guy who signed the Allman Brothers. And so I'm thinking, well, this is great. I'm gonna be a rock star. I had hair down to here. I'm gonna grow it further down. And this is gonna be great. <laughs> Uh, while we were actually in the process of recording our first album, we had four songs done, uh, the label was then bought out by a larger label, Mercury Records, uh, and Mercury had no interest in us at all, so I was signed for a grand total of three months, uh, and we were dropped. But I then went into the financial industry. I basically, a lot of my career was on the financial side of the entertainment industry. And basically, first of all, what can a major label do for you? Well, uh, they can actually hook you up with the best producers, best arrangers, co-songwriters. They can get you in the best studio. They can re-image you, and then they can turn their massive marketing machine on behind you. They can get you in Best Buy's weekend ads. They can get you plenty of press. They can get you as the opening act for a major artist. They can get your song on a major movie soundtrack, and they can get you on Saturday Night Live. And I think for some of you perhaps out there, you're thinking, that's why I want to sign with a major label. And let me tell you the real story. Back in the day, for every 50 artists that major label signed, they did that for one artist. The other 49, they did not. And you, you may wonder, perhaps, if you've noticed, some artists are big for like four or five years back in the day. They had these couple of multi-platinum albums, and then they just fade, and they can't sell anything. The reason was because the label decided they'd serve their purpose, and they took those engineers and producers and songwriters and arrangers, and they moved them on to the next artist. Uh, and this was the model the labels were using back when they could get you to pay 12 to $14 for a CD, and there were no singles. You'd had to buy the CD to buy the song. Today, where people buy singles through, legally through iTunes and illegally through the other places, that model does not work for the labels anymore. It barely worked back then. It certainly doesn't work now. But I also saw in my career other types of artists that we dealt with. Smooth jazz artists, uh, blues artists, uh, bluegrass artists, artists that were never going to sell two to three million copies of an album, were never going to play Madison Square Garden. They were either signed to regional labels, or they were signed to genre-specific independent labels, or they were signed to small subsidiaries of major labels. And these artists, I actually saw, were generally happier. They basically did the music they wanted to do, they released music when they wanted to do it, they toured when they wanted to tour, 
And many of them have 20, 25 year careers. And, and I said, that's what I wanna do. I wanna be independent. And today, with all the things we're gonna be talking about and have talked about, the technology for recording, marketing, digital, everything that's out there, you can do it. You know, we'll be talking more detail as we go, but bottom line, why do I prefer to stay independent? Because basically, I control everything. For good or bad, it's under my control. So that's basically why I do it. What role does physical product, actually having that tangible physical product uh, play into an artist's success these days? Well, well, first, if you don't mind, I'd like to just kind of preface this by just giving a little bit of background on myself. Um, I've been in the music business now for over 20 years. I've never worked for a music entity. I've always operated as an independent. So it's thrilling to me today to see all of these tools that we now have as independents at our disposal. So I come from a world where initially I was actually signed to a record label in the 80s and eventually or fairly quickly decided that I didn't like the fact that I gave away control to this third party and I slowly started to release my own records and then quickly found that I preferred to be more so behind the scenes and began to release other artists' records. Eventually figured out actually how to not only release the music and have product sitting around, but also get that product into major retail around the United States by securing deals with significant national distributors. And before I answer your question, I want to say that probably one of the biggest misconceptions, in my opinion, today about the music business is that because we have all these tools, that that's really all we need just to be available. And I want to say that although a lot of that is true, we have tools that really help us build awareness. First and foremost, build the awareness. So in other words, if you don't have a fan base, if people don't know your name, if people aren't clamoring to go to your shows, it really doesn't help to have your music available on any of these services that we see and we talk about and we hear about day in and day out. Uh, if you're able to build that awareness, if you're able to connect with an audience, then beyond doing all those things that you know, we will talk about and we've talked about a little bit so far, I would say that one of the most powerful things you could have at your disposal is having physical product available. Because despite the fact that we're in this digital era, I don't believe that there's anything that's going to resonate, not with a casual consumer, but with a fan. I don't believe there's anything that's gonna resonate more and provide more value than something that they could hold, something that they could feel, something that they could share, something that they could get autographed, something that they could display, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say that today for any artist that has fans, that's, that's really the premise here, if they have fans, then indeed it's an amazing opportunity to be able to monetize that connection by providing that memento, if you will, that keepsake, in many ways that badge of honor that a real fan wants. And they walk out of that show holding that piece of merchandise, holding that CD. And I think that's one of the things that we probably should walk away as music business professionals. We should walk away with uh, a lesson from the growth in vinyl. Anybody in the music business, I'm sure everyone on this panel would probably you know, say that we would be talking about science fiction if you would have told them 10, 20 years ago that vinyl continues to grow year upon year. You know, and, and, and as someone, by the way, that has manufactured vinyl for the better part of the 90s and even part of the 2000s, it's almost unbelievable that we're seeing this growth. And the folks that are buying this product, this antiquated configuration, are not people that are 50, that grew up with it. It's people that are your age, people that are teenagers, that again, once again, want to have that extra connection to that band that they believe in. And if you can provide that value, if you have fans, then I don't think there's a better way to go. I think it would be silly to not think about you know, physical product. And I'm not talking about a CD. It doesn't have to be a CD. It doesn't have to be a record. It could be something that you create. There's so many different experiments going on day in and day out. I'm sure we've heard of them. All these new, you know, uh, uh, hybrids between merchandise and music. And I think really this is an era of experimentation. And that's the beautiful thing about all this access that we have, not only to music, but access to these artists, because now we're not under these constraints 
of the old business where it was about mass producing this one product that everybody had to have. Now you really are empowered to do something totally different. It could be a novelty. It doesn't have, some, has to, doesn't have to be something that you know, you're gonna do over and over again, but if you can put something on the table, literally put something on the table, the merch table that resonates with your audience, then at the end of the day, that's providing value. And by the way, that merch table could also be up here as well in the cloud. I'm going to take a little bit of a risk here and ask you the one question that I always like to ask at the end of a session like this. Did anybody learn anything today? Cool. Well, if you did and you appreciate it, please show some love for our panelists.